Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our Friday forecasting talks. It is Friday, it is 2 p.m. and it is uh, year 2022 now. So we start our webinars with a talk on uh, Internet of Things with Kai Hoberg. Uh, but before we go to his presentation, I would like to say a couple of words about the center, about what we do, who we are and so on. So this slide shows uh, us. We currently have uh, nine members of the center and several PhD students. Um, we provide a variety of services, including bespoke uh, short courses, uh, consultancy, software development and so on. You can see the whole uh, list of activities here. Master Summer Projects is one of the things that uh, your company might find interesting. This would be a type of project that a student would do uh, over the summer period of year and uh, the student would investigate a specific problem and help you solving this problem. Um, and we have other ways of working with us. We have uh, expertise in a variety of areas, including marketing analytics, supply chain forecasting. We have experts in machine learning and uh, experts in inventory management. And if you want to get in touch with us, we have different ways how you could how you could do that. You could follow us on Twitter, send us a message there. You could follow us on LinkedIn, send us uh, a direct email. So you can also see a bit um, additional information about us on our link on our page web page and finally we have our youtube channel where we typically upload these uh, videos from these events and from other events as well right so now we're moving to kai hoberg i think he will introduce himself this is the topic of his presentation so kai you can start sharing your screen very good perfect well, welcome everyone uh, to my talk. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm in, in Hamburg today. Uh, so uh, I, I want to quickly touch up on our research around Internet of Things and how to use IoT data for demand forecasting and inventory management. So this is really some research we started a long time ago um, and it took some time until we actually got usable data. Uh, on the topic and uh, now we have the right data and I think this is really interesting because it might also affect many business models. So a quick introduction of myself. I'm a professor of supply chain and operational strategy here at KLU in Hamburg. Um, I spent all my academic life in operations and supply chain management. Uh, working at different universities in, in Germany, but also overseas from time to time. Um, and uh, after my PhD, I worked for four years for one of the big consultancies, and I still work with, with many companies from time to time. Cool, let's uh, talk about this talk. Um, so this is really joint research with my PhD student, Sandria Weissun, and Yel Hira from the Technion. Um, and we really want to understand how IoT devices can be used for smart replenishment. So when we talk about smart replenishment, we essentially mean automatic, autonomous uh, replenishment of consumables. And um, this is an interesting challenge in, in many areas. And uh, we picked a setting of a professional coffee company uh, that has access to a few thousand uh, IoT connected coffee machines. Um, and over the time, we realized there are a couple of challenges. Um, the first challenge is certainly about the data. And I'm going to dive a little bit into the complexity of the data afterwards. But you can imagine that uh, getting almost real time data from thousands of machines could certainly be a challenge. And if you scale up, if you we are here in a B2B setting, if you move to a consumer setting where you probably have hundreds of thousands of customers, uh, that's certainly um, a more challenging problem. Uh, then forecasting is certainly important. So we want to understand what will be the demand of the customer to ensure that we can replenish this customer before he runs out of stock. And 
To do that, we also need some inventory management practices. Um, so we need to come up with the right inventory policies and we need to deal with inventory inaccuracy because in our setting, we can't observe the inventory level directly, but we need to calculate the inventory level based on replenishments and based on consumption. So let's uh, start with some motivation. Uh, and I want to show you a, a quick video. So um, I, I realize that I'm not be able to, to share the sound, but you realize there is some very powerful music in the background. And this guy is looking into the fridge, trying to get some beer, but there is no beer left. So, and that's a solution Budweiser pioneered in 2016, uh, what they call the first smart beer fridge. So the idea is really to, to track the number of bugs in the, uh, in the fridge. Uh, so the, there are sensors that track how many beers are left. And based on that, you will be able to keep track of the stock, set your minimum replenishment level, and uh, get replenishment before you run out of stock. And then there are some nice features uh, for the football fan to ensure that uh, before the game of your uh, team, there is always enough inventory. So um, that's, that's the idea of the Woodbinder solution. And uh, actually, there are many similar solutions around. So let me stop that video. Actually, there are similar solutions already around. So the Smart Fridge by Budweiser is certainly one setting. Uh, it's been piloted, but I don't think it's wide, been widely rolled out. Uh, there are other solutions like uh, the iBin uh, by Wirt. So on top right here, you see uh, a container that keeps track of uh, the inventory level of CPATH. So either we are camera or we are a weight sensor. And the idea is that nobody needs to uh, take control of those uh, inventories and there will be a replenishment triggered if there is no uh, or little inventory left. Uh, if you look here on the bottom left, there is the idea HP has been using for some time for their professional printers, uh, for the professional laser printers, and now they've been rolling that out to, to the B2C setting, where the idea is that you purchase um, a number of printed pages per month and HP will take care of the rest. They will ensure that you will pay for the printed pages and they will ensure that you don't run out of ink. Um, another example is here at the bottom right, and I think that's very interesting. So that's uh, one of the um, premium washing machines of the uh, Miele company. And here the idea is uh, rather than uh, adding detergent every time you run the machine, there are cartridges at the bottom um, that ensure the best dosing of the detergent based on the weight, based on the program used. And uh, this, uh, the inventory in these cartridges is also tracked and you are informed via your handheld device to replenish when your inventory, when your detergent is running low. So there are some interesting solutions already out there and uh, there are a couple of advantages for the manufacturer um, that is offering these solutions. Uh, the first one, it's, it's driving consumption. So if you look here at the, the brush on the left, you realize, yes, um, I typically need to change the, the brush head every four to six weeks. People don't typically do them that frequently, but you can signal the customer and ship new brush uh, heads to the customer uh, to ensure that he's really able to get the best cleaning result. And um, if you look at other settings, you realize that the customer should not run out of inventory, which is also driving his usage. Uh, in the middle, you realize, yes, the customer is locked in and there's also this intermediation. So if Philips is um, shipping out and selling those brush heads directly, um, the company can bypass the middleman, can bypass the retailer. Um, the customer is essentially locked in. I'm not sure if there are alternative brush heads available, but in this setting, um, Philips will be able 
to sell all the goods directly to the customer and there's no way the customer can buy alternatives. And the third setting, the third advantage is certainly uh, real-time visibility up to the point of consumption. So the manufacturer has full transparency and can essentially see what's the daily consumption in a certain zip code area, what is the inventory of the customer, and that's certainly providing some visibility, some, some help for better planning. So I think many companies are really trying to work on uh, IoT solutions. Uh, there are lots of visions. Uh, I think uh, there are also failed visions like the dash button of Amazon, which was not particularly smart because there you needed to, well, still push the button to ensure that you trigger the replenishment. But with these IoT devices of, I'd say, the next generation, the device should be able to automatically understand what's the consumption, what is the inventory left, and trigger a replenishment based on that. So that's really the, the motivation of our research. And uh, this started like three, four years ago, and um, we were still trying to get some data for some time. And then there was a lucky coincidence. Uh, we met with uh, a coffee service provider um, of a leading European coffee manufacturer. So this company has uh, more than 30,000 uh, devices installed at their customers. So these are professional customers. They use machines like the one on the right. And um, if you look at these customers, they are in very different segments. So they are maybe in your office, uh, they might be in a restaurant, they might be in bakeries, in hotels, at leisure, uh, lots of different segments. And the company has started to roll out these IoT connected uh, professional machines uh, since uh, or in 2017. And these uh, machines are able to track the consumption of coffee. So they can track how many cappuccinos, how many cafe lattes, uh, how many espressos were um, uh, provided by the machine on a given day. On top of that, there is some additional data on maintenance or, or on, uh, on, on, uh, on the programs uh, used. But that's not really interesting for us. So uh, really um, what's interesting for us is the idea you can track the consumption at the user. So here in this case are the professional users. And uh, if you look at the process, at the replenishment responsibility, in the current process it's well very straightforward. So there's a customer who decides to order. Um, then he sends the orders of coffee to the coffee service provider and the service provider delivers. So there is no advance notice, there is no visibility of uh, when the customer will order. Customers might forget to order and run out of stock. Uh, then they ask for rush deliveries or they will buy coffee somewhere else. So that's all happening in this case. In the future, with an IoT enabled setting, the idea is that the customer uh, has a shared consumption data that is analyzed by the coffee service company. And then the coffee service company decides on the order and sends the deliveries. So very, very simple idea. And uh, that's good for the service provider for a couple of reasons. So, First, um, they, they can really advertise that there is limited effort uh, in the replenishment process. So there is nobody in the office or at the bakery responsible for, uh, for uh, re placing the order and forgetting about the order. Well, then the customer is also locked in, so he essentially cannot really buy other coffee and they are also thinking about some new business models that they started to implement based on the IoT data. Uh, instead of having uh, something um, where the uh, customer is built separately for coffee, for the machine needs, for maintenance and all this stuff, they um, started to offer a paper cup a model uh, where the customer is essentially paying an all-in price 
for each copy that is taken from the machine. Cool, so what do we need in order to achieve that? Well, as mentioned, there are a couple of challenges. The first one is around demand forecasting. And really, how to best forecast the consumption based on the IoT data for many customers. And I, I should add, in a way that the company still understands how the forecasts are generated. So we, we also looked into machine learning, but we ultimately decided with the company for another approach. Um, then certainly the inventory control at the customer. So how to use forecasts to set up an automatic replenishment with high service levels. And high service levels, something 99% plus, is certainly uh, required in this context to ensure that the customer trusts the service provider and there is no uh, stock out uh, too frequently. And finally, yes, the, the challenge, the third challenge is around the replenishment under uh, inventory inaccuracy. So we cannot observe the inventory directly, but we need to estimate it based on the uh, shipments and based on the consumption. And certainly there can be a lot of problems. Let's say there could be a lot of problems based on this approach. Uh, and the obvious question is how to incorporate this potential inventory inaccuracy um, if we cannot observe the demand directly. So you realize this is really a holistic problem and uh, I, I realize, yes, I'm in the in the forecasting seminar, but I hope you, you still also like our ideas around the inventory management. So let's talk about the data. So we, we got a rich data set from the company. So roughly 120 million drinks provided by 11,000 IoT enabled machines for a period of two and a half years. Um, so we stopped when uh, COVID uh, started to corrupt our data uh, with the data that we used in our um, in our uh, analysis. Um, and you, you can imagine that uh, the distortions of COVID were pretty severe for certain segments. And we started to pre prepare a little teaching case around that. Uh, so 120 million drinks uh, and then the customers were at the time uh, placing manual orders. So uh, roughly uh, 200,000 orders uh, placed by 4,000 customers and you realize that some customers have multiple machines. Um, we also have the machine customer history. We have all the information about the master data of the customer and then we started cleaning. And since we had so much data, we were rather generous removing data. So we wanted to avoid any overlap and the, any ambiguity in the master data. We wanted to have, um, so machines were coming online every month, essentially every day, uh, but we wanted to have sufficient pre-COVID uh, data to, to train our models. And based on that, we generated a data set with 11 million drinks for around a thousand machines from all the different segments. And uh, we had an according data set around orders that were placed by these customers and the master data required. Cool, so that's really the setting and the data. Um, now let's, let's dive into the analysis. So if you look at the analysis, um, there are essentially three steps. First, the demand forecasting, then the inventory control, and then the replenishment under inaccuracy. So the first step, well, we wanted to get good forecasts. Certainly we wanted to have very good forecasts, but not necessarily the best forecast possible uh, because we realized, yes, with machine learning, there could be some, um, um, it might be difficult to interpret. So that was uh, at least one requirement by, by the company. Um, so we started to create uh, ARIMA models. Um, so ARIMA models with exogenous variables. And we considered many different exogenous variables like holidays or public holidays, uh, stuff like that. 
And based on that, we did an in-sample modeling and an out-of-sample evaluation using some SARI-MAX approach. And I come to the details in a few seconds. Um, for inventory control, we said we're going to apply RQ inventory policies. So here the idea is we set a reorder point, and once the inventory hits the reorder point, then we order a quantity Q. And the order quantity could be packs of five or 10 kilograms of coffee or multiples based on the size of the company. So we fixed the minimum order quantity. Uh, we started to have daily reviews. So every day we check if the inventory at the customer uh, drops to the reorder points. If it drops to the reorder points, we start a replenishment. If not, uh, then we wait. And that all with a high service level target of at least 99%. Um, and again, in sample optimization and later out of sample evaluation of the performance. That brings us to the, the third and really challenging uh, step, the considering the inaccuracy. So uh, we calculated the recorded inventory trajectory over a year since the machine was installed. So at one point in time, we assume, yes, the machine is installed and we know what's the initial delivery to the customer. And afterwards, well, everything, every inventory uh, level at each point in time should be theoretically be calculated based on the consumption. Um, one cappuccino, nine gram of coffee, one cafe latte, 11 gram of coffee, um, and by the replenishment, 10 kilograms of coffee, for example. Um, and that should really be the case, but we realize there are inventory developments where the inventory increase, the calculated inventory increase or decrease. In the first step, we wanted to understand where is the inventory calculation out of control. And we run uh, all S logistics regression to understand where, uh, what are drivers of inventory inaccuracy for certain recorded inventory developments. Um, and in the next step, we introduced uh, a customer specific correction factor. So if the inventory drops significantly below zero, which cannot be the case, but the company is still uh, consuming without any problems, then obviously uh, our assumption on the consumption is too high. Then that could well have to do with the setup of the machine. So these are the three steps and now I want to show you some results. So let's start with um, the forecasting and let's have a look at the data. And you realize that the, there are very different patterns based on the different segments. So if you look on the left, there is uh, one customer in the office segment and you realize that demand seems to be rather stable. Um, in the, on the right, you have one customer in a casino context and there you realize there is a lot more volatility. So the, the consumption seems to be more noisy. Um, and if we if we look at the daily sales pattern, you realize ah that's kind of expected. So at the office customer, the consumption during the week is that pre-COVID data uh, pretty pretty stable with a peak on Wednesday. So probably people need some coffee on Wednesday to survive the week, uh, but no consumption on Saturday and Sunday. Obviously, that office is closed on the weekend. And on the right, we realize yes, this uh, casino customer has a uh, much lower level of demand, but also uh, um, not too much seasonality during the week. So that's the day of week. Um, if we look at public holidays, we realize yes, uh, there are certain drops here for the um, business uh, for the office customer around the Christmas period. So obviously people are staying home, taking vacations towards the end of the year, towards Christmas and something similar to uh, with a shorter effect there around Easter. 
and um, the consumption at the customer um, is again volatile. So, so it seems like Good Friday, this customer is closed, uh, which could be the case based on legislation in Germany. And if you look at that, uh, we can essentially classify uh, what is the demand pattern we are observing. And for these two part customers, we could consider, yes, it's smooth, uh, maybe that's more lumpy, um, but that's certainly uh, room for interpretation. Uh, so, Zarimax. So, we uh, applied uh, a couple of, well, many different model variants of the Zarimax model, where we used uh, all these autoregressive, seasonal moving averages uh, terms. So, in total, um, more than 300 model variants. Um, and we fixed that for at least one year of data and uh, tested the quality based on the BIC criterion. And uh, then also uh, we tried to um, not have an individual model for each customer because, again, uh, the company felt that the uh, all customers in one segment should be treated by the same forecasting approach. Um, and um, we also had this concern, yes, Zari Max might be good, but machine learning should certainly be better. And when we when we ran this analysis, we realized, yes, uh, yes, it's better. Uh, so 60% of the forecast improved, but of these 60% uh, that improved only 70% increased by up to, uh, or let's say, uh, put it the other way around, only 30% increased more by than three percentage points. So how does the forecasting accuracy look like? Um, if we look at the day ahead forecast, we realize, yes, um, for, for many customers, it's um, uh, pretty okay, given the volatile data, but for other customers, it's not really good. And that's for the daily demand forecast. Uh, however, we realized that for many customers, the, the daily um, decision might not be required. So maybe instead of a daily uh, decision, we need a, a weekly uh, demand forecast. And if you look at the forecasting accuracy for the weekly demand forecast for this office segment, we realize, yes, that's already doing quite a bit uh, better. So that's already doing quite a bit better. So um, certainly we realize um, it's not perfect, but it's probably a starting point. But we can also correct for that if we decide on the state safety stock level. Um, and the next step, we did the inventory management. And for this customer, here, the inventory development looks pretty good, right? So we set the reorder point to 4,000 grams of coffee, so essentially eight packages, and we set the reorder quantity to roughly uh, 10, to exactly 10,000 uh, 10, grams, so 20 packages, and you realize, yes, there are frequent replenishments, and uh, this all seems to work rather well. Um, so now we wanted to understand what is the uh, um, what is the service level based on that. And if you look at the service level, um, and here I probably want to focus on the optimal safety stock level, that a green and red line. And you realize that even for customers with rather poor demand forecasts, uh, the service level target can well be met. So. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter too much if there are uh, six uh, packages of safety stock or eight packages of safety stock or 10 packages. So I think the inventory availability based on the out of sample performance is actually pretty sufficient. And that's for, again, for the office segment and um, the situation for other segments is essentially quite similar. Last step, the inventory inaccuracy. 
handling the inventory inaccuracy. And well, as I mentioned, we can't observe the inventory directly, so there's no weight sensor in the machine, but we need to calculate it. And for many customers, this works just fine. So here you see over the course of the year how the inventory develops and the yellow line is essentially an average cycle inventory through the order uh, periods. However, there are also other customers. So this customer, and he starts with an inventory of 10 kilogram, and then at some stage there's a replenishment order, and this is not really working out, right? So recall, this is the this is based on non-IoT data. So this is not based on IoT replenishments, but that's based on the replenishments of the customer that are triggered by the customer. And at some point, this guy is minus 20 kilogram in terms of his inventory position, and certainly there's something wrong. It could also be the alternative case. There's a customer that is ordering from time to time. He's consuming constantly, but his inventory level is shooting up. Um, so now we first run the analysis to understand what is driving this in inventory inaccuracy. And there could be technology related factors, contract related factors and customer related factors. For the technology, um, there is something around the grinders that are used in these professional machines. So there are different machine types and not all of them are using the same uh, grinder. So, and if an average cappuccino should get uh, 10.4 uh, gram of coffee, it might be that the grinder will only deliver 10.2 gram or uh, 10.7 gram. And over time, this will certainly, this little error will certainly add up. And uh, there's also different effort in terms of the machine calibration. So ideally you have the machine perfectly calibrated based on the consumption uh, per dose, but this is not always happening um, with the best effort. Then there are some contract related factors. So um, for the paper cup business model, all the shrinkage, spoilage, spillage, and all the amounts bypassing the machine um, are, are affecting the inventory. So I only pay per cup. I pay 42 euro cents per cup of coffee. And I don't care if there is shrinkage, if uh, a customer, uh, uh, an employee needs uh, some coffee for his home and takes uh, a package home. Um, yes, that's something we can't control for, but that's certainly happening. Uh, if there's a rental business model, so the classic model where you pay separately for each consumable and where you also pay the rent of the machine, um, there is more likely to see decreasing inventory, uh, so um, negative inventories, because there might be external supply sources that are used. So they might see a promotion at a retailer and just buy some coffee because it's cheaper than the one provided by our industry partner. And then there are some other customer related factors. So we see that bakeries, restaurants and casinos are more likely to use external supply sources, possibly because they have very high stock out costs. So if there is no inventory left, uh, well, they just go somewhere, buy some inventory to ensure they can still sell the three euro fifty cafe latte. So, and there is certainly also individual consumption and order patterns. So, and finally, in our last step, we are now introducing correction factors. So for each customer, there is uh, a correction factor on the dosage that is uh, used for the modeling. So instead of 8.2 gram per coffee, it might be corrected to 8.4 or to 8.0 gram of coffee. And we hope that this will help us to, uh, to better track the, the inventory consumption. Cool. So 
I, I was asked to talk for 30 minutes and I realized my, my time is now over. So to quickly summarize, so it was our objective to really design an auto replenishment system, what we call smart replenishment based on IoT data. Um, there is an academic contribution, hopefully. Our reviewers will uh, see that as well, that we are really taking a holistic approach to this topic to auto replenishment system. And it's really extending the vendor managed inventory concept uh, that has been well reasonably popular uh, over time to the point of consumption. And, but we need to relax this assumption that this technology can provide us with perfect visibility. So there are also some managerial implications. So um, ultimately, there might be cooperation required by the customer to really make this VMI setting uh, work. So um, the assumption of the company was we have this technology and based on that, it will solve all, all our problems. But we are show, uh, showing that it might still be required to have regular physical audits or customer feedback to ensure that the inventory levels can be maintained and that the inventory is somehow uh, realistic. So, and there are some directions for future research. I'm gonna skip for now. So with that, I think I'm out of time and let me end my presentation. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Kai. Uh, now I, we have, uh, I have asked uh, Annalina to provide some sort of uh, feedback, let's say, so a short discussion on the topic. So Annalina, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks, Kai. Um, that was very interesting. And um, I think there is also a lot of potential for um, companies to use that technology in the future. Um, I, I have a couple of questions and probably too many, so <laughs> I will just start with, with a couple of them, but I'm happy to continue the discussion afterwards. Um, what I was wondering, whether you have any idea of how large the acceptance from consumers is for such a technology? Because so the data that you just presented um, for coffee machines, that was mainly used in a commercial setting or in an office environment. Um, and I can understand, well, probably I wouldn't mind if Miele knows how much, um, how, how often I use my laundry machine, these kind of things, um, even though even there, there could be some data protection issues and there are certain people who I would, wouldn't want to have the information on how much I'm washing at the moment. For example, if I'm on holidays and I'm not using my laundry machine at the moment. So do you have any idea of what the consumer acceptance is? For, for such technologies? I, I think that depends on the country. So I, I was uh, discussing that with some Asian colleagues and they said, well, come on, that's not an issue. That's a German issue. Maybe it's a European issue. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, in this commercial context, in this B2B context, uh, the customers seem to be happy to adopt that. So uh, there is, I, I haven't heard of any, any pushback. Uh, the company has also uh, a business to consumer division and they have um, something like a Nespresso machine and uh, they have now started to pilot the, uh, the same approach for uh, business to consumer coffee machines. And I don't know about the acceptance uh, and the acceptance issues. So it's it's very it's a very small pilot. I think they started off with some 50 pilot customers that all belong to the company. But I, I, I certainly agree. It could be a touchy problem. Whenever we talk about IoT data, there will be some people getting nervous. I think it could also be related to brand loyalty. So if I'm always buying the same product over and over again, then probably I don't mind that much. Well, if that company sends me the products again, but if I'm a bit more adventurous and want to try out different brands, then probably I wouldn't want to have some automated replenishment. But yeah, just a thought. I um, mean, a lot of companies are talking about the smart fridge, right? And uh, there is, I, I haven't seen anything that is really close to a smart fridge uh, that is automatically placing replenishment orders. But uh, in this discussion, there's always a, 
idea to distinguish between goods that are just commodities, milk, butter, uh, some standard cheese, and the goods that are interesting, where I like to shop. And for, for these, it's probably very hard to, to really get something uh, like smart replenishment uh, started. I think there could also be potential for making more sustainable decisions. Because you know, if, if you go to the shop, then all the products need to be in some fancy packaging kind of thing. But if it's just the replenishment, then they could ship bigger quantities and then I just need to refill at home. So I think that there could be some potential as well for that. But yeah. Um, yeah, I was um, wondering when you presented your data set um, on, on the coffee data, it, it's huge, right? It's like more than 110 million drinks. But then after you did some data cleaning, it was reduced to like 11 million. But, but not all of those data points could be duplicates and so on. So I was just wondering, are you losing some information that was in the remaining 90% of the data set um, because of the data cleaning? Or was no, a systematic um, approach how you reduced it? I think we lost quite a few uh, companies because we said initially, let's focus on a consumer that has one machine. So you realize there are many customers who might have multiple machines and um, uh, then it's, it's a, a bit hard to, we still have to do some aggregation, right? So we still have to do some aggregation from uh, multiple machines to inventory. And in the first step we said, well, let's skip this complexity and let's avoid that. And I think that's, uh, that's the reason for the majority of the data loss. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And when, since you just mentioned the aggregation um, and you mentioned that you were analyzing the data in some segments, how did you define the segments? Was it, I don't know, you presented casino offices and so on, or are there other segments how you aggregated the data? Uh, so that's the classification of the customers by the company. So they, they uh, have a classification for each business of uh, a potential uh, customer. And that could be uh, hotel, care, restaurant, bakery, coffee bar, and so forth. So we essentially adopted their classification. And then um, you, you, you initially analyzed the data on a daily basis and you came up with forecasts for daily data, but then you realized that weekly might be better. So what kind of seasonality, well, first of all, which one did you use in the end and what kind of seasonality did you consider within the weekly data then? So uh, in the weekly data, um, we used a uh, uh, lack of seven. So uh, essentially what you would assume uh, for a week, the, uh, the seasonal uh, weekly that, uh, pattern. Um, and for, the, for moving to the inventory management, we essentially uh, decided to go to the uh, aggregation level of a week. But ultimately, it, it doesn't really matter too much because what it will affect is the safety stock uh, level and the reorder point. And ultimately, it, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. Okay. And, and I guess it's important because uh, if, you, if you look at the left side of this data accuracy, uh, chart, uh, forecasting accuracy chart, you will see well, there are quite a, a number of customers with uh, forecasting accuracies of below 50%, which should be worrisome, right? Uh, but on the, on the, on the one hand, um, a replenishment, so these errors should even out over time. And uh, since there are quite a number of periods between two replenishments, um, it, it, it helps to reduce the impact on the uh, on the forecasting uh, on the inventory management. Sorry. And when you looked at the inventory record inaccuracies, that data was without IoT. So with IoT, you wouldn't expect to see these kind of inventory record inaccuracies, at least not in to that extent. But you would still see some record inaccuracies, for example, because of the amount of coffee that goes into making one cup, there might be some um, uncertainty around that, or it, at least it might vary depending 
It's on, a, I don't know a, who, who may, I don't know, this is weather dependent, <laughs> but there could be some factors that influence it and the make of um, a machine and these kind of things. But isn't that some information that you could track as well if you if you're already connected to the Internet with your machine? Mm, partially, probably, yes. So we 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 know what is a machine. We know what are the recipes uh, that are pro programmed in, and we know the amounts of coffee for each recipe. But what we what typically needs to be recalibrated from time to time is the the match between the recipe that's installed and the um, and the uh, amount of coffee that's going into the machine, into the coffee. So you realize, yes, 8.2 gram. Um, I don't know how many beans that are, but that it, it needs to be very accurate. And if if the error is somehow normally distributed around the mean, it's okay. But if it's, uh, the mean is skewed, or if there is a, a left or right. Uh, uh, turn data, um, then, then it's certainly a challenge, right? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think these are where my main questions and uh, I think we already have some questions from the audience. Um, well, thanks a lot, Kai. It's really interesting. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the other questions. Thank you very much, Annalena. And thanks, Kai, for responding. Uh, I see uh, on my screen that John and Robert uh, are showing up. Uh, does any of you want to ask a question? Please unmute yourself and yeah, John. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation, Kai. I, unfortunately, I missed the first 10 minutes because my computer decided to auto update various things and it was very annoying at exactly the wrong moment. But fortunately, I did manage to get in. So I actually did hear the great majority of your talk, which I, I, I must say I found very interesting. Um, I suppose a couple of questions for you. One is I noticed that your achievement of service level, although the target was very high, it was even higher than that. I was just wondering why that might be the case. And related to that, and, and I noticed you used the grid of lumpy and erratic and so on, and you did have quite a number of items, um, Ivan smiling because of course this is close to my heart, this particular grid, um, but I noticed you had quite a few intermittent and lumpy items. I just wondered whether you'd considered alternative, I know you wanted to use one unified approach, but whether you'd considered alternatives for those sort of items, which are really, I suppose, seasonally intermittent, I guess. Yes, you, you are right. And uh, if I would uh, do some forecasting research around the topic, I, I would certainly agree that this approach that we are taking, one model class for everything, is certainly not the best. So, uh, um, so the idea of uh, my PhD student and my co-author, and also my idea was to really take a holistic look at the topic, and that's why we we didn't really uh, go into more, more detail. But uh, I, I completely agree with you. That's a, a rather simplistic approach uh, to have uh, one model class for for every customer segment. Um, in terms of the uh, overachievement of the, the service level. I think that has to do with the uh, long time period between two orders. So uh, um, I, I guess there are um, many customers have a replenishment that lasts for many months. And uh, so certainly a replenishment will be triggered and delivered within uh, five days. So based on that, there uh, there is this rather high service level um, that overshoots essentially. OK, thanks very much, Guy. Really interesting. Thanks, John, for the question. Robert, do you have a question? Uh, yes, um, and again, thank you. Very interesting integration of the, the, the various issues. And in a way, uh, I noticed Marcel's question in the uh, uh, which you uh, in the Q and A, and it, it's a very similar question. So perhaps the uh, you can see uh, Marcel's question. It's where the greatest benefits are. So my question is slightly more academic. What's the benchmark by which you would have uh, evaluated? Because I, I detect in your tone a slight, well, this is a good idea, but, and 
you can see, you, you know, you put a lot of research effort into this. Uh, the, the, there's no automatic solution to it. So there are various practicalities in terms of implementation. So benefits, uh, benchmarks, and what's the practicality? That's a wonderful question. Uh, I, I, I was very frustrated initially when I saw the forecasting accuracy. Uh, and I said, well, that should be better, right? But we don't have a benchmark. There was no forecasting done on the on the skew uh, uh, customer level, so that that didn't exist. And also for for the service level, we, we don't have a clue about the current service levels. So uh, how many customers are running out of stock and buying goods somewhere else in order to deal with that? Uh, we, we might have, but that's also not tracked at the company, ask for how many rush orders were placed. That's ultimately, um, it's hard to benchmark against something that is really relatively new. So, um, and that brings us to the, the question of the benefit. So, the, uh, so the, the company really sees that uh, twofold. So first, they uh, realize, yes, it's, it's an instrument that can reduce the effort and the burden of their customers uh, because they don't have to worry about running out of stock and they don't have to worry placing any orders on time. That's that's the well, maybe the marketing side, and then the um, their 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 benefit is uh, certainly um, that they are able to do better control the the inventories to ensure that there is no shortage at the customer which would result in essentially lost sales for them and if you take a strategic perspective uh, they have started to have this uh, paper cup model that's also rather unique in the in the market so uh, uh, because they can now and but that doesn't have to, anything to do with the automatic replenishment or with the forecasting. That's only because they can track the consumption of the, the uh, users. Uh, and that's also something unique for them. Thank you. OK, thanks uh, for the question, Robert. Thanks for response, uh, Kai. So I guess uh, Marcel's question is uh, answered then. Uh, let's see what we have else in the chat. Um, there is a question of uh, how would you tackle the problem in the COVID period? Because you just said that uh, we remove it. So any thoughts of what to do with it if we really need to handle it? So, uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, what we see there is that the, uh, the consumption dropped very quickly. So. Uh, I think ultimately with with lockdowns, you would see a very different pattern uh, there. So uh, offices are certainly affected uh, heavily. Uh, some bakeries are affected uh, heavily. Other bakeries are uh, affected to a slower a lower degree. Uh, but uh, ultimately, I mean, what, what's nice is you now the company can get well almost in real time uh, information about what's going on at the consumer, right? So essentially I, I was arguing that they might have a better visibility of how uh, certain restrictions are implemented compared to politicians who might not have this visibility, right? Uh, so in Germany we have this uh, rule that you don't, you shouldn't go to the office so, and that comes to, uh, back to the privacy concerns Annalena had. So we can check if the company is still using a lot of uh, drinks at the day and uh, checking out what's going on there. Um, so, but if you go back to the technical forecasting, I think uh, with, the, with the right models, you, you can adjust for that rather quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a slightly technical question from Aga. Uh, you, you said that uh, machine learning performs well, uh, sort of better than a Remax at some point. Uh, can you explain why it, it outperforms? And uh, an additional question from me, what do you mean by machine learning in this context? 
I, I guess um, so. We used some uh, packages in 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 Python, um, essentially uh, support vector machine models, and uh, there um, uh, we 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 didn't. Well, obviously we spent ninety percent of the effort on the Darren Max modeling. So potentially there could be uh, still something in for the machine learning approaches. Uh, but since we got the indication also from the company that this is not what they were interested in, uh, we, we didn't go along that path. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I recall I had a, a long discussion, well not long, but I, we had a, a call with uh, Robert uh, some time ago and he immediately said, why don't you use machine learning? So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's typical of Robert, always wanting to do machine learning. I'm just joking. OK, uh, so we don't have any more questions in the chat. Uh, the only final question which I would ask, it's a bit philosophical one. So do you think that uh, this is definitely the, the future of our world, uh, Internet of Things uh, in every house, in every company? What's your uh, vision? I I have mixed feelings to be honest. So uh, um, I my my personal feeling is that there will be many interesting applications that are going to pop up. Is it going to change to the world in the next five five years? Definitely not. Is it going to have uh, an impact by the end of this decade? I I would assume yes. So I I would assume. There, there might be ways that companies solve these problems. Also, I mean, the ultimate thing for me is the smart fridge, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering there, there must be uh, an application and a use case for the smart fridge. And once people get used to that, I think they are open to let technology into the home. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for interesting presentation. Thanks, Annalena, for your questions. Thanks, John, Robert, for the, your questions. And thanks, everyone, for attending. And uh, see you Excellent. all. Hi, very, in two very weeks. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us.